Hello, Atmore. It's the Lauren and Friends Show. And now here's your host, Lloyd Alberton. This is Lloyd Alberton. Good morning, and I'm talking with Miss Ann Novak. That's not Novak. Right. Just <laughs> I always want to call her Novak. Yeah. I think there was an actor, Ernie Ernie Novak or something like Kim that. Kim Novak. Kim Novak, yeah. yeah. But uh, Miss Ann Novak, Nowak, <laughs> no, is it Nowak or Nowak? It's Nowak? okay. My mom goes by Nowak. We say Nowak. It's, there's okay. so many different pronunciations. And uh, she's sometimes known as Annie. Uh, some of you may remember her coffee shop, Annie's Coffee Shop. But I'm not going to tell the story for her. I'm going to give her a moment here to introduce herself and uh, just whatever whatever comes to mind and then we'll... Okay. We'll proceed. Um, my name is Anne Marie Nowak, and I am now working as a professional, a uh, licensed professional counselor downtown Atmore. Um, came to that position <coughs> in kind of an interesting way. I turned fifty, and I was working for the Porch Band of Creek Indians, a job that I absolutely loved, working with the kids there. Going into the public schools, I was a prevention coordinator. Um, but when I turned 50, I decided, well, okay, I'm probably gonna be working for another 20 years. And I want to do something that I really love. So I went back to school to get my master's in counseling and now, time timeline. This is after the coffee shop. I, this, this is, is after the coffee shop. Yes, I moved here. Um, I moved to the Amore area in 2014. Okay. I'm 2004. I'm sorry, 2004. <laughs> okay. Um, and yeah, and then opened the or not opened, bought the coffee shop, and worked in the coffee shop for, gosh, I think it was about five years. And then the we had the oil spill and the economy tanked, and that just wasn't working any longer. So I went to work helping my sister, uh, who makes jewelry, and did that for a couple of years, helping her, and then um, took the job with Porch. Okay. Now, let's go back a little bit. Okay. Uh, because I... My reference point, uh, I came to Atmore back from traveling the world. I don't remember what year it was, around 2000 or running there. And uh, I had a little group of folks we used to meet over at the coffee shop for uh, trying to get up a little storytelling group. I don't remember what it was, something like that. But it was Annie's then. Yeah, Annie's Community Cup. Uh -huh. And I don't remember just what year that was. But now you... Uh, you came here, you bought the coffee shop and came here from somewhere else. From the Miami area. I was in pharmaceutical sales for about right at 20 years. I lived in Pembroke Pines, uh, Florida, and for part of that 20 years I covered, gosh, the state of Florida. So I traveled towards the end of my time as in pharmaceutical sales, I worked with um, physicians who were researching a new HIV medications. Okay. So I was a, um, like a clinical specialist. Okay. Now going even further back, where'd you grow up? Grew up in Buffalo, New York. Okay. Well, born in Buffalo. Family moved to Shreveport, Louisiana when I was eight. So what did your father do? My dad worked for Arcla, um, Arcla Oil and Gas. So he sold the big compressors that go out on oil rigs. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So you end up in Louisiana for that. Okay. Yeah. So it was it was kind of funny because we were, you know, northern kids. I don't even remember what month it was. It must have been cold because I remember getting off of the plane with our winter coats, you know, arriving in Louisiana where it was warm. And uh, that was just a big transition. All of our relatives in Buffalo thought that there would be alligators walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> they just didn't know what to expect, you know, because mm -hmm. we, in the neighborhood that my parents grew up in, people just didn't leave. You know, you would spend your life in that same neighborhood. So it was, their worldview was quite small. Mm -hmm. So to have a member of the family move and move the whole family so far away. It was kind of unusual. Yeah, it was unusual. Yeah. So you moved to Louisiana, you were at what age? Eight. You were eight. Yeah. 
and uh, and you came from New York, right? Uh, were, were the people funny? I mean, what was your impression at it eight was, years old? Was it you know we? Or it about the same. I was talking to my mom about this, and we were so lucky because the neighborhood that my parents moved to was um, it was in, it was called Southern Hills, and it was f- a neighborhood full of young families. So right off the bat, it was just a bunch of kids, and the neighborhood was um, small enough that we could just get on our bikes and ride anywhere. And that was the time when everybody's parents looked out for everybody's kids. Um, that was in Shreveport? That was in Shreveport. Or, or was it like an urban area? Uh, that was in Shreveport, a, in a Shreveport. little suburb okay. of, yeah, Shreveport. Okay. So, um, but we would spend our time at the creek, and we would climb pine trees and do all kinds of dangerous things that my mom never knew about. <laughs> well, it sounds a lot like Atmore. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, Shreveport... Um, is kind of outside that uh, Cajun triangle. You know, right. you go to New Orleans or Baton Rouge, Baton, Baton Rouge they say. Yes. Uh, Shreveport's totally different. It is totally different. That. It's really more like um, like East Texas. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. So right there, very close to Texas. So we, growing up, we were big Dallas Cowboys fans. Okay. But um, I have a sister and her daughter, a niece, who my sister Kathleen lived in Baton Rouge for a long time. I don't even know how many years. And my niece still lives in Baton Rouge. So we have a little bit of that mixed in. You don't have much of, well, well you know, I started to say you don't have much of the accent, but you didn't have that Cajun accent. No, definitely not a Cajun okay. accent. We, we One of the things I do remember is that when we moved to uh, Louisiana, Edwin Edwards, was the governor at that time. Mm-hmm. I remember him. And he was so handsome, but we could not understand a word that he said because he really had that Cajun <laughs> accent. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he said governor a long time. Yeah, he did, he did. And then I think he spent some time... Um, in jail? Yeah, in the clink. <laughs> <laughs> I think he did. <laughs> in fact, I, for some reason, I think it might have been with Joe Patty. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> it could have been. People in Louisiana loved him, though. They just oh, kept voting him in. They didn't care absolutely. what he did. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was the kind of guy who, you know, his personal life was a mess. <laughs> but nobody mattered. I mean, it didn't. It just didn't matter to anybody. It, you know, that must be just Louisiana because they've always had, uh, what do you call it? Interesting Color, politics. Interesting politics. <laughs> right, colorful <laughs> politics. Wor- worse than Alabama, I can even I Oh, can yeah, say. I think you're right. So you grew up mostly in Louisiana? Yes. I was, yeah, I was in Louisiana until I was in my early 20s. Okay. Now, you have a sister here in Atmore, Kathleen. I do. Kathleen Tucci. Nowak Tucci. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, who's the oldest? She's older than I am. She's, She's older. much older than I am. Much older. Two years. <laughs> I, I, I was dubious of that statement because my yeah. brothers and I do the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I introduce older. her as my much older sister. <laughs> <laughs> well, we may have her on the program, so be careful what you say. She may get you back. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I've heard from her yet, but hopefully we'll have her on. Uh so you left home and went to college from Louisiana. I actually, I went to the I went to Louisiana State, which was right there in Shreveport. Okay. So the kind of the Shreveport um, campus uh-huh. of LSU, and um, I worked. My first job out of college was actually selling copying machines. I worked for a small business in Shreveport that I sold Minolta copiers. And I did that for about 18 months, and I knew I wanted to go into pharmaceutical sales. My mom um, was a practicing nurse at that time, and she said, uh, she came home one day, and she was like, Annie, this is the greatest job ever. You make good money. You get a company car. And at that time, I thought, man, nothing could be better than that. Good money and a car. (laughs) So I had answered some you know, responded to some ads for pharmaceutical sales. But then I thought, you know what, I'm going to go through the PDR, the physician's desk reference, and I'm going to send resumes to each pharmaceutical company (coughs) that's listed there. So I wrote my letter and went through and mailed it out to each company listed. And I actually heard back from about four of them. And I ended up getting a job with Astra Pharmaceutical. 
Uh, how do you spell that? A S T R A. A S. It's now AstraZeneca, I think, but um, it was interesting because I got hired with Astra, and the way their training process worked was they would take everybody up to their home offices in um, Massachusetts, and I think it was Massachusetts. Um, but they would take everybody up there, and you'd be in training for, you know, it was two months. Um, you lived there for two months and learned everything about... They put you up, paid for everything. Oh, put you up, paid for everything, did all the training. I think you were allowed to go home once during that time. Uh-huh. Um, but then what they would do is they would send you anywhere in the country that they had an opening. And you kind of agreed to that when you came on. And so I... And I don't know why I did this, but I lobbied for Miami. (laughs) I had never been there in my life, but I thought, well, that that seems pretty exciting. Uh So I ended up going to Miami. So it was really interesting um, being, I think I was 26 years old at that time, moving to Miami, having never been there. And it was really like country girl come to the big city. (laughs) What, how long were you in Miami? 20 years? 20? About 20 years, yeah. I lived in downtown Miami for 10 years, and then I moved, bought a house out in the suburbs in Pembroke Pines for about another 10 years. So how was it living in Miami? I loved always, it. Really? Oh, I loved it. I loved it because, you know, I was young. There was every kind of sporting event you could think of, you know, so I got to go to basketball games, hockey games, football games. Um, there was a, a big... Um, venue near where I lived and so I would go to concerts there were wonderful restaurants it was I loved the fact that it was so culturally diverse I would be in a grocery store in Miami and somebody would walk up to me and um, start speaking Spanish and I thought gosh you know I don't look like somebody who would speak Spanish but then I learned that Cubans are actually very fair Um, and so it wasn't unusual and one day in a grocery store, I had to mime <laughs> to a, this lovely lady how scooping cat litter worked because neither one of us spoke the other's language. Uh-huh. So she figured it out and I figured it out. And so she got what she needed. Did you ever learn some Spanish? A little bit, a little bit, but now it's gone. <laughs> what well, was it a big deal for your pharmaceutical? Sales. You know what it? They thought that it would be initially, but it really was not because the you know of course all the doctors spoke English. Um, there, my territory was so big that it went all the way from West Palm Beach, which is completely different than Miami and South Miami. So it it really was not imperative. After me, they did bring in a guy after I I um. Actually, I was still there, but they brought in, it was another position. They brought in a guy who spoke Spanish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in some areas that was probably beneficial because, you you know, you just kind of, when you're similar, you know, more like the people that you're talking to, you know, and Mm -hmm. you can speak to them in Spanish. And um, I remember one of the things I was... The vernacular is was somewhat slang. And, you know, they would greet each other, Tabian, Tabian. It probably took me a year to understand that they were saying esta bien. Esta bien. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so and it would ha- they would speak so quickly. Cubans Cuban dialect is a lot faster, isn't it? It is. It's faster and, and just some of the words are, you know, cut a little slightly different. Yeah. Cut a little short. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, now family, did you marry uh, along the way? No. Nope. You've not Never married. You never married. No, nope, never married. Well, I'll be darned. Yeah, and no children of my own. I always, when people ask me about children, um, I always tell them that I have none of my own, but hundreds of others. Uh huh. So. Well, weren't you kind of all alone out there without family? Did you um, get homes- homesick? Uh, you or know alone? what? I I got I did get homesick the first couple of years, but I always planned my schedule so that I could come back to my mom at the time had moved to Pensacola and so I always scheduled at least three times a year that I would drive to from Miami or from uh, Pembroke Pines where I lived 
to Pensacola three times a year. So that was your connection to Pensacola, or did this? Yes, area, yeah. Your, yeah, mo- no, your mother moved. Why yeah, did she my move? mother moved. Actually, my mother was a uh, McDonald's owner operator, okay. and so she. Um, Unfortunately, my dad passed when he was 50 years old. He was just, he had just gotten his first store. Mm -hmm. And so um, he passed unexpectedly. So mom was really thrown into um, the McDonald's business. And it was at a time when the McDonald's corporation was expanding to include more women owner operators. Mm -hmm. So mom Mm -hmm. sold the store um, that she had just outside of Shreveport and ended up buying several stores in Pensacola. And so she moved to Pensacola with my two brothers. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, so it, it ended up, it ended up being a, you know, a good situation for everybody because they were closer. Mm-hmm. I got to see them more often. I had um, two at the time, well, by the time I bought my house, so 10 years in, I had two little black poodles that would travel with me. <laughs> and they were they were the best traveling companions. You know, I had one poodle, Jake, who we would stop. He loved fast food, first of all, but we would stop at McDonald's. And um, it was Jake and Zsa Zsa. And Jake would so primly eat, take a bite of a French fry. Zsa Zsa would grab my fingers. I mean, she, <laughs> she just ate that French fry. But Jake was just so delicate and he would eat half of his french fry <laughs> what kind of dogs were they they were little poodles little poodles yeah and it was kind of, it was really fun because you would go i would drive through the um on the turnpike you know you, they would have the toll booths and oftentimes the toll operators would have uh dog biscuits treat. yeah yeah, yeah. The one so, would take his finger off and rub me. Yeah, exactly. And I had to make sure I gave them to him, you know, separately because, you know, Zsa, Zsa who was, by the way, the smallest one, t- a tiny poodle. Mm-hmm. But she, my mom said she ruled the house. <laughs> she did. <laughs> <laughs> she was a smart dog, too. Uh-huh. So. Now, uh, when your mother moved to Pensacola, Kathleen, you said your two brothers came with Yeah, her. Kathleen yes. was living in Baton Rouge at the time, and... Um, they decided, to, uh, she and her husband decided to make a change. He worked for UPS for many, many years. And so they ended up coming to the Atmore area. So I ended up, actually, they had, she, they bought a house here and she hadn't moved in because it took her, they had to sell their house in Baton Rouge. And so mm-hmm. I remember I came to visit her and my mom drove up from Pensacola and I remember thinking, oh, you know, this is so beautiful. It's the, all this farmland is just, and so different from what I was used to in Miami. And I just, I fell in love with it. And my sister takes me into that. She said, oh, you know, I saw our house, which was beautiful. And the, the housing prices here were so reasonable. Um, they had gotten, ast- gone astronomically high in the South Florida area. And she took me to the um, community cup, the coffee shop there. And so mm-hmm. we're having our lunch and she says to me. Um, it Was it a coffee shop then? It was a community coffee shop. Cup. Yeah, owned by Joel Lambert. Yeah. Okay, I remember when Joel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So she took me there and, and she said, um, hey, Annie, she said, uh, this coffee shop's for sale. And I said, it is. And I said, do, do you want to do it? Do you want to do a coffee shop with me? And she said, no, not me, <laughs> just you. If you did it, it would just be you. So I went home um, to back home to Pembroke Pines and just started thinking about it. And at that time, it had, when I first bought my house out in Pembroke Pines, it was it was beautiful. In fact, they when I left Miami, they told me I'd need a passport <laughs> to come back. <laughs> <laughs> they considered it so far out. Yeah. But at the end of 10 years, it had become so crowded and so much traffic. And just it just took forever to get anywhere because it was just always traffic. And I started feeling like just, you know, another person on the road, you know. And I mm-hmm. thought, well, now would be a good time to make a change. So that's how I ended up in Atmore. Well. Wow. You know, that's happening uh, all over right now. I uh, have some friends that just recently moved from L.A. Guy owned uh, several funeral homes and I've been out there his whole life. And said, how in the world did you end up in Atmore? 
<coughs> yeah, quite I, a story. It was, yeah. and it it was a big change. You know, it was it was a very big change. I what was interesting. Well, more on the big change later, but um, it was interesting because I was maybe last year I was going through some things in in the extra bedroom. And I found a some pictures that I had purchased, some pen and ink drawings that I had bought at the Red River Revel, which was back when I lived in Shreveport. So I had to be in high school then. Okay. They were rural scenes. And I thought that was so amazing that I had two pen and ink drawings that I was drawn to at that time that now truly could be something that you would see driving down any of the... the country roads in the Atmore area. Right. So, but it was a big change moving from, you know. And, and what year was that? Do you remember? About 2004. 2004, okay. Yep, yep. Okay. It was a big change. And, and the people that I left behind in Miami, they just felt like I was just kind of going into retirement. And well, you did, re did you re retire? I didn't retire, no, I didn't retire, but I thought that I could slow down, and that was my goal, and I, I did slow down. You know, I, at times I felt like, <laughs> compared to Miami, life had come almost to a screeching halt <laughs> sometimes because it was just so different. You know, during those first few years, I would think nothing of going to Mobile or going to Pensacola or going to Spanish Fort, you know, just to get out because I was used to those long drives. I was used to that, you know, going to a restaurant in Miami. It was nothing to drive an hour mm -hmm. and meet friends. Yeah. So the drive was not much. Um, that's changed quite a bit now. My sister lives probably five minutes away from me. And I'll moan about having to go to her house. Go five minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, can't you come here? No, no, you come here. I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, you know, uh, in years past, that more, uh, when I was growing up here, um, Pensacola was a trip to the big city. You didn't go that often, you know, or right. mobile. Uh, but now we drive to Pensacola to have lunch. You know, it, it's just things have changed in terms oh, of yeah. distance. Oh yeah, highways and so forth. Yep, yep. So, uh, did you do the joint ownership thing with your sister? We did not. Did no, you? I ended up buying it myself, okay. and it, it was interesting because before I bought it, I thought, well, you know, running a coffee coffee shop can't be brain surgery. I mean, it's you know, people learn how to do it. Thing. You know, it was pretty hard. <laughs> was much harder than I anticipated um, because you go it, being a, a business owner it's like all of a sudden I was a uh, you know in charge of the finances I was in charge of inventory if there was anything wrong I had to look at the electrical system to see what was going on I was plunging toilets you know mopping floors dealing with employees it was it was a lot you know when I was in uh, New York early 2000s I used to work in manufacturing and I traveled a lot and uh, when I when I left that industry uh, with the dot com bust back in the early two thousands, uh, I had some money in my pocket at the time, and I decided, you know, I think I'm just going to do what I always wanted to do. I used to love to watch these old uh, hobos ride the trains. I want to bum around for a, a couple of years, and I said uh, I'm going to. So I researched and researched how to make this uh, coffee. What, what do you kind of? Uh, I'm not a coffee drinker. The uh, uh, the uh, espresso? Espresso coffee. Yeah. And I said, you know, if somebody suggests to me, get you one of those things and you can do these festivals. And I said, boy, that's the thing for me to do. I'm just going to get me a, a espresso trailer and do these festivals. That got to be a lot more complicated. Just the espresso machine. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, <laughs> was that more than too. I ever oh, that too. And I, I, you know, and I had to learn how to how to work that, you know, when it went down or when it needed parts changed. It was learning so much um, that you you just kind of take for granted, you know, that people know this and Everybody know how to run a business. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're like, oh, that's easy. Anybody could do this. Um, but it was tough. <laughs> well, did you do all right financially with it, or was it um, a struggle kind of making it? Was, it, it was a struggle, but, you know, I really hold myself responsible for that because it was um, – you know, I was used to making a very good income. Well, you know, going back, those pharmaceutical jobs, I've spent most of my work career in, in sales. 
and those pharmaceutical jobs are coveted. Oh yeah, I mean, I when I left, it was a six-figure income. So the transition to being self-employed, um, I did not financially handle that well. Um, like my mom said, it's always hard to come down. You know? <laughs> so, so I did come here with a lot of money in my pocket. Um, a lot of that went to, uh, how can I say, keeping myself entertained and, um, you know, propping up the coffee shop. Um, it really was, I, I could not make it as financially viable as it needed to be. Mm -hmm. And then when, you know, part of it was because I had changed, you know, kind of changed the structure of how I paid my employees instead of dropping down to a waitress wage during the lunch hours, I thought, well, it's just fair to pay everybody minimum wage, Mm -hmm. you know, so that increased my costs that way. And, you know, I tried to cut costs and work with it in other ways but it was so in Atmore it's so difficult to predict what to expect for the lunch hour because you know if if one like let's say Buster's has a lunch special that people love you know Mm -hmm. then that's where people are going to go you know certain days people go to David's certain days people go to Dixie Catfish you know and some days so people kind of move around if there was a I remember during Easter week when the churches would each do, I think, a lunch um, on those days, I remember business would just drop down to nothing. So it was trying to see what was going on around Atmore, engaging what I would need to do at the restaurant for that. I mean, just the smallest changes would affect, you know, the coffee shop traffic. So. You know, uh, I've often thought that in, in Atmore, people love to eat. And uh, the best business option would be to start a restaurant. Uh, you know, if, if a lot of businesses come and go, but a restaurant, people that have more love to eat, and they'll try a new restaurant. <clears throat> but uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot restaurant of work. Restaurant business the, is a lot of physical work. It is, and the margins are really low. I remember one of the things, you know, we would have a formula for our pricing. You know, we wouldn't just, like, make up a number, right. you know, but you want, you know, 30% would go to your labor, 30% would go to your um, costs and, or your, you know, your supplies. And so there was a formula that we would follow. And one of the things that I heard often was, you know, well, that's, you know, $5 is a lot for a drink. Um, you know, that's what you'd pay in Pensacola. And yeah, it is what you'd pay in Pensacola, but milk is the same price in Atmore <laughs> as it is in, in Pensacola, right. you know, so... I, it wasn't that I was getting my supplies any cheaper just because we were a smaller town. Right. And it's really difficult to make people understand that. You know, I, I remember, too, one of the things is if we would change our cups, you know, from a 12-ounce cup by one manufacturer to a 12-ounce cup from another manufacturer, and one would be tall and slim, and the other one would be a little more squat and wide. But people would question, you know, oh, well, that's not 12 ounces, you know. that They would feel like they were, you know... <laughs> being cheated and I would have to say no it's the same see <laughs> you know you know that's funny that you know that's a classic uh experiment in psychology I, I think uh, John Piaget uh came up with this idea about children how right they, how that caused conservation right <clears throat> if you pour into a different size a taller cup right the amount change Which exactly one has the most Exactly. And uh, generally, you get past that about three years old. <laughs> but you're saying... Not when it comes to your coffee. Not when it comes to coffee. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 But, you know, it was... I loved working with the customers in the coffee shop, and I loved working with my employees. Um, it was just... Uh, it was a really tough business. I learned a lot. I made some mistakes. You know, actually, I, I think I probably made more mistakes um, then I, I don't want to say that I would admit to, but because I admit to them, but it was such a learning experience and it was such a time of growth. And it's often said that you learn more from your failures than you do yeah, yeah, from your that. success. So it was, it was a wonderful experience. And I still think about those years so fondly. And I think about the customers that would come in, you know, the regulars and, you know, the relationships that I developed through the coffee shop and I absolutely love the building that the coffee shop was in. Mm-hmm. Um, 
that stayed empty for years because I just couldn't sell it. I couldn't part with it. What's there now? The right now, it's, it's called Nelson's Place. It's a venue. Okay. Yeah, and she's done a, a wonderful job of, okay. of fixing it up. It, it, you know, she, it looks better. I think that building looks better than it ever has. Okay. Um, and it's Tracy Nelson that has that now. Okay. But it's, it's really beautiful. But I've, uh, that building just, to me, is, is so, it's just a perfect building. You mm-hmm. know, it's just an old downtown building. That has so much character with the hardwood floors and the brick walls yeah, and yeah. the and I think it used to be in a furniture store um, a long time ago. Um, I remember when they the roof was being um, something in the roof was being patched and a receipt from the the furniture store came down off the roof. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, did you envision kind of a uh intellectual gathering place when you envision a coffee shop I don't, well, we I, have a coffee shop in town now the mascaros uh, i think yeah. they are doing all right with yeah it. i think i think they're doing well yeah yeah but, yeah but people like to go over and visit and talk and get to yeah know yeah and i think i think one of the challenges that i faced is that that the actual building was quite large and it had the Probably tall too large it was i think it was too large you know the tall ceilings which visually were beautiful but it costs so much to heat and, and air condition. And I remember mm-hmm. one month I got an electric bill that was $1,200. Wow. And I thought, I mean, that was towards the end, you know, because that is a, that's a lot of coffee. <laughs> so, so a lot of coffee. It is it. a lot of coffee. <laughs> and so I, you know, I then later on learned that there was a, a problem in the, um, with the air conditioning and heating system where one was turning the other off and on. And that's what was, that's what the oh. problem was. But, you know, that was after I had already realized that there was just no way that I could make ends meet with those kinds of expenses. Um, so that was, that was a hard, hard decision to make. So where did you move from there? From there, I, my sister had actually started making um, rubber jewelry, recycled out of recycled bicycle inner tubes. Okay. And so she had, um, she was working at the time with my other sister that lives in California and uh, Kathleen's jewelry had ended up on the cover of um, Italian Vogue. Okay. So that was pretty amazing. We were excited about that. And, and this is made out of bicycle tire. B- inner, inner tubes. tubes. Yes, inner tubes. Well, yes. I'm trying to visualize it. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Um, if you look at her website, you know, KathleenNoactucci.com. Okay. It's really beautiful jewelry. But um, the amazing thing is, too, is people thought, oh, well, this is just, you know, kind of a flash in the pan. Here's your 15 minutes of, of fame. And she's still going strong. But she's so talented. She, she says that she has more ideas than she does time, and I think that's so fascinating. It is. You know, she's she's just so creative, and she works with different mediums and adds things on. She works. Um, are you familiar? She with, sells mostly on the internet. She well, she sells only through a catalog called Artful Home, okay. and it's all handmade items. Um, but are you familiar with Nespresso pods, the Nespresso machines? It's like a, an espresso machine, the single, yeah, um, yeah, single okay, use. Yeah. So they're yeah. little metal pods. Well, she okay. has taken that metal and used it in her jewelry design. So it's all recycled materials. And Nespresso noticed this, so she's made big um, art pieces for their conventions. And it's really been interesting. So I worked with her. For a couple of years and then you know we just decided that i needed to get a job with some health insurance and some regular benefits so i saw the position um now during this time if i get too personal during this time you made all this money in pharmaceutical and you've mm-hmm. had this coffee shop are you starting to feel drained at this point oh yeah oh flushed? yeah because i you know i um i was starting to feel drained um I, because i had really you know, I lived like I was still making that income. Yeah. And my wife and I often joke, we're both retired now and we still want to live like we it, it, that's a it is a hard transition, <laughs> you know, and I think especially too at that <laughs> age, um, where I was, you know, I was still at the age of accumulating. And now that I've gotten older and, you know, I, I that has really stopped. Um 
it was it was a difficult transition to make from having you know a six figure income coming in mm -hmm. um, and a company car to you know now that being gone. Yeah. So I was definitely feeling the pinch there. Yeah. So. Did you ever consider going back into pharmaceutical sales, or was it kind of I, past I, that time? No, I did consider it. I, I considered it pretty. Um, pretty hard because I it's hard to find reps that will you know come into the more rural areas and mm -hmm. I thought well you know that that's kind of a niche that I could fill and but then I thought but do I want to go back to that rat race it's kind of a rat race up there, isn't it, it? it's so hard because you truly are judged every day every week every month on what your sales figures are so mm -hmm. it didn't matter you know with the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies that I was with, it didn't matter if you earned, you know, the top president's awards, which I'd won several trips that I took mm -hmm. my sister on. Um, it, that didn't matter because it was all about today, you know, so what are your numbers today? And, and you, you know, in sales, it's like you're, you're treated almost like you're a failure because you're not making your numbers today. And it's like yesterday I was your hero, you know, and today, uh, you know, you're telling me I'm not doing it right. So, you know, figure that one out. But it's yeah. it's a lot of pressure and it's a lot of stress. You, I totally understand. Yeah, yeah, you definitely, they get their pound of flesh for that, you know, for that income. I mean, there's a reason why it's, it's a, a well-paid job. There's energy or, uh, that you have when you're younger that you do that. As you get older, you kind of scale back or go down a few RPMs and, and you get back into that and it's just... Uh, you're the same person. I, I've done that. I, I said hey, most of my work career was in sales, and you know, since I've retired, I've picked up sales jobs here, and I just don't have it anymore. It, you know, it, I, it just seems like I don't have it anymore. I get that, it. That certain I, age. Yeah, I totally get it, and I think that the the thing that has changed most for me was that um, with the pharmaceutical sales, I would do a lot of um, programs or interaction with like the office. So it would be from like being on with a group of people, you know, giving presentations and talking and following up on, you know, on the research and how that was going. And then kind of now it's, I have that same energy for one-on-one -on -one interactions. So I'm not so much sure that my energy level has diminished that much. I think it's more Your my, interest, yeah, exactly my interest. So it's more, I'd rather work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, or with couples or with much smaller groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that sounds like it's kind of a, what's the word, see, uh, see into, or moves in, I can't remember what the word is, moves into uh, your current counseling right. career. Yes. Now, tell me how that happened. That well, sounds... I was, um, when I took the job at Porch, it was under... So you just applied for a job. I uh, did, but... I did. They had a, a job... Um, for a prevention coordinator okay. and at the time it was working under a grant teaching um, doing teen pregnancy prevention programs okay. so when they um, when they hired me on it was you know really from ground zero like we had to pick out the program that we were going to use to teach the kids and there are so many programs out there and that's really where my um, research background came in handy because I could look at the you know the evidence that all these different companies presented with their <coughs> programs and I could decipher okay so you know this was really evidence-based you know this means that they they tested it thoroughly and they showed a difference in the outcomes with the children that they worked with um, some programs had stronger evidence than others. So we, you know, I was able to narrow it down to the one program that we would use. And then at the time, and it was, you know, how many years ago I was with Porch for nine years. And, you know, so 10 years ago, people were still very sensitive and, and probably still are about talking to kids about sex and teaching teen pregnancy prevention. Right. So that was, that was really interesting because we started, you know, did a lot of surveys and, and gathered a lot of information on the reservation. And then we decided to move the program into the schools, offer it through the local schools because um, kids, uh, tribal kids interact with kids from all over the community. Mm -hmm. So I uh, ended up going into the schools and doing teen pregnancy prevention. And that was... 
it, that was a wonderful experience because kids come off as if they know so much about sex and, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that the, the question was just targeted at the, what, what age level? Middle we school, did, we, middle school, we did, um, eighth grade, um, and then eighth grade in both at Ernest Ward and eighth grade at, um, the middle school in Atmore. And, you know, of course, parents had to sign consent forms and, and make sure that they were okay with you know, what we were going to discuss. And, um, the, you know, as I mentioned, the kids, the questions that I got were, it was amazing because I was so glad that they felt comfortable enough. Now, let me just interrupt you real quickly. Okay. Now, you, you moved into the schools, you were work, your employer was the porch. Companions. Right, right. So, how did that connect? Well, it was, was it was kind, kind of, of state a, program. It or? was a service. It was a it was a federal grant. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, teen pregnancy prevention. We started out working with the kids, um, with the tribal kids, in the for the summer program that Porch did, and then we made the decision to you know offer it to the community, and working with the local principals. You know, if this is if this was something that you, you know, think would be valuable in the school setting. And um, they thought that it it was okay, okay. Great. So, yeah. So so in that, you know, a lot of kids would stop, you know, after class, and they would want to talk. And so there was kind of that was kind of the dawn of you know small bits of counseling that would take place, you know, during the sessions because I, we would go and spend the day. So it's like every period we would get a different group of kids you that would, would cycle assign you through. A classroom. Yeah, or... exactly. Like we would be in language arts, you know, in an eighth grade language arts, which every eighth grader has to go through. Okay. So we'd be in that classroom and just as the classes changed, you know, we would teach the same lesson, you know, seven times, you know, that, you. that day. So, um, yeah, so so then kids, you know, would talk about things and, you know, learned of some kids that had some some difficult situations at home. And, um, you know, the same thing kind of on the reservation is when I'd be back there because I'd work with the kids that were in the Boys and Girls Club first as a mentor um, and then, you know, started working through the years with larger and larger groups of the kids. But you, know, you see kids struggling and when we see children struggling, we know that more than likely there are struggles at home, you know, issues that, that may or may not be beyond the, well, most of the time are not beyond the child's control, you know, so working with kids to get through those difficult times really, you know, that, that really touched me. You know, I remember struggling as a kid and what that felt like. And, you know, although I'm I'm almost 60 years old, you know, I still feel like being 15 wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, me too. <laughs> I, know. I feel trapped in I an know, old man's exactly, body here. Exactly, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you have, you have intuitively or, or inherently um, a, an understanding or compassion for young people or for others in general. I do. I do. You know, I really drew you into this. Yeah, it, it did. And I think too, after I moved to Atmore, I had the experience um, to get to know several people that I love dearly that struggle with addiction. So that's another area of interest for me. Um, when I, you know, these people that I love dearly, I, I saw kind of what was going on with the whole family and how children were impacted and seeing so much um, addiction in this area and, um, you know, working with the kids became very important to me. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I, for a few years ago, uh, we served in our church, we're LDS, uh, through the LDS Social Services, we were called to serve in an addiction recovery program. Ah, okay. And uh, we didn't see that many people. We were called at the higher state level, and I said, well, would we have to like, go drive to Mobile or do something? He said, no, you do it right there in Atmore. They'll come to you. And I said, well, I'm not sure if anybody's going to show up, but uh, we did that for two years, and we hardly ever had a meeting. People didn't show up, and we learned a lot. Oh, yeah. Probably more than anybody came to the class about addiction and what people are struggling with. Yeah, and it's so hard because there's there's still so much stigma with addiction. And, 
you know, generally we know that the people who struggle with addiction, you know, whether it be alcohol or drugs, are trying to change the way they feel. So they're struggling with something that happened to them, something they experienced, um, something that went on that made them feel. That they needed these things. Exactly, that they needed to change that, that bad or negative feeling. So that's, they generally, you know, would self-medicate with drugs or alcohol starting when they were younger, and then things just really would escalate from there. Um, you know, the, the difficulty... Now, are you still working with the addiction area, or I are do. you more into the youth uh, pregnancy? Kind of pregnancy both. Thing? I work with, I work with fam- the DHR, with many DHR families in Bruton. I go to Bruton two days a week to okay. see clients there. And several of them are, you know, parents who have struggled with addiction. And so we now, really... Now, are, are your clients appointed by uh, courts or something? They or, Well, they are. Some, are they, like, um, yeah. If you don't have you don't have private paying customers. You, you, I do. You I do. have okay. both. Yeah, yeah both, I have both. Okay. I do. I, I accept private insurance, but I also work with the DHR clients who are court ordered. Okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm reimbursed by the, you know, by DHR right. for seeing those clients. But... Okay. Um, I think the thing that that I'm proud of because I've worked so hard at is that I have a high success rate with reunifying um, f- parents with their children. Really? Um, That's yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm really proud of that. And I think a big part of that comes from you know the understanding of addiction and not when so people. So is come the addiction me, on uh, the child to the parent? Is the addiction on the parent's end or yes, the child? Yes, yes. Um, Mostly in the parent. Yeah, in the parent, yeah, where the parent has tested positive um, either at birth or, or throughout the pregnancy. I see. Um, or if, you know, there's an, uh, an incident where, you know, DHR has been called because they don't feel like the children are being cared for and the courts, you know, intervene and, and the parents are court ordered to attend counseling services. Now you have an office you go to in Bruton for two days a week. Is is that? It's actually uh, at DHR. At DHR, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, wh- where do you? Where's your office over here? My where, office where in Atmore is from? in the Lyles Building, um, upstairs. The Lyles Building. Where yeah, it's right there. Um, it's right down from the post office. I know where you're talking about. Yeah. Upstairs. Yeah, it I has a balcony you around it. You've got yeah. a okay. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, yes. I love that old building. I love that old building. The trains go by and rumble. I did not know that was you. I see that banner there. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't, I didn't that's really me. Know who that was? Yeah, that's me. Yeah. So, um, what else? I you know seeing the clients at DHR. Those are probably some of my most challenging, uh, but most rewarding clients. You know, it, do most of them come into the office to see you, or do you do home visits? I don't do any home visits. They do all come to the office. Either they'll come and see me here in Atmore, or I'll, whatever's most convenient for them. They'll see me in Atmore, or they'll see me in Bruton. Um, you know, I I have had. I think the hardest thing to deal with is when you have parents who who do go return to their addiction. Mm-hmm. You know, and that has happened as well, and and that's that's really difficult. You know, because, you know, as a, as a therapist, you, you may want it more than they do, but you can't, you know, you can't do the work for them. Right. You know, um, I, I went back to school, got my master's degree in, in counseling psychology after I moved back here and retired. Oh. Um, never have done it, but uh, uh, one interesting thing that I recall, I don't remember who developed this uh who was the founder of it, but it's called uh, Syst- Systems. That And it kind of goes like this. Uh, you always look for the third party. Whereas if, if you have two close buddies and another new kid moves in from school and he enters the group, problems. Uh, oh, yeah. Marriages. Uh, that's, that in this family, uh, they, they can't, they fix, they usually find one one kid that said he's a problem, can't fix him. Right, and you and you work with him, and you get him kind of fixed, and send him back to the system that he, and he just goes south again. Yeah, and, and some counselors, you got to bring to the whole family. Well, exactly. You yeah, and it's lot, and you know, and we're kind of we're not in the job of fixing, and that's the mistake that I think some people have made. Where you know, I've had one um, grandmother who brought a child to me, and and you know, one time, and we talked, and 
you know, and then the grandmother called me several days later and, you know, well, you saw her, what, you know, why can't you, you know, fix this? And it, because it takes more than that, you know, it takes figuring out what is going on with the whole family, you know, um, with the family systems. It's interesting because we also call that triangulation where, you know, two people, instead of talking to each other, they'll talk about the other person to a third party, and then the third party talks to the other person. And so then you have somebody involved who really has nothing to do with the problem, but who further escalates what's going on. Exactly. Exactly. A lot of that happens in, in families with with um, mothers-in-laws, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, yeah. where there'll be conflict there, you know, um, where the, the mom will, of the, either the, the, you know, father or, or, or the mother or father of the children and the, the um, grandmother will want things done a certain way or have expectations of what, you know, her son should be doing for her versus mm-hmm. at his own home, so... Well, uh, this idea of fixing people, what's your opinion on that? Can you can you fix anything about people, or do they rarely change? I do I mean, think that people change. That must be change. a frustrating uh, well, no, feeling because for I think, you. Well, it is, um, it's not fixing people, but what it is is it's um, walking them down the path so that they, to assist them in finding their own healing. And so often people will look at circumstances or situations in a way that is not healthy for them. And having, you know, a neutral person that can say, well, have you considered this, you know, Mm -hmm. or have you looked at it like this? Or, you know, so your, your parents said these horrible things to you, you know, when you were a child, do you believe those things that, that a child is capable of being that horrible, you know, and really kind of dissecting down and, and figuring out what's going on. Do you see that a lot where pe- uh, people are blaming their parents going, I mean, like, you know, I'm 80 years old and it was my mother's fault, you know? I mean, no, do people I, eventually gravitate toward getting over that? Or do, do you see a lot of that hanging on to somebody else um, maybe who I am? I see people hanging on to maybe choices that they made, um, earlier in life yeah I think regrets or you know all of us I mean hindsight is 2020 none of us would choose to (coughs) to make a mistake you know if we knew what it was going to lead to but I have um you know I think that that some people struggle with you know parental relationships but I haven't found many that that flat out blame their parent they just can't figure out why they're struggling and as we look into it you know it's like oh yeah you know that that did happen to me you know i was treated that way or you know a lot of times like in relationships um people will often repeat what they saw the relationship between the mother their mother and father because as adults we teach children what love looks like what does a relationship look like right. whether it's healthy or unhealthy they observe that so you know sometimes um, children or you know adult children will enter into relationships that look exactly like the relationship that their parents had and you know oftentimes that's it, kind it of their unhealthy. normal it is their that's, normal. that's their uh, what uh, rod that they hold on yeah, to their standard it, it's, right it's what feels Okay, you know, it's what feels normal. Even if normal is bad, it still feels normal. So. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it must be, uh, how are you enjoying this career? Would you put it as you found where you belong? Oh, I I absolutely, absolutely um, found where I belong. It's, I don't feel stress at all with with this job well, that's a good thing it's a wonderful thing it's you know i feel tired because it is hard work you know um you know sometimes uh, my days are are booked what about you know, marriage counseling do you do marriage counseling i do i do some marriage counseling probably less of that than than anything else but i will work with couples okay now how uh if they're not appointed to assign to come see you how does somebody uh, seek you out? They just call you, or oh or? yeah, a lot of folks. Um, I have a, an ad on um, Psychology Today, and okay. health insurance companies will you know let people know what therapists are in, in the area and who are accepting okay. new clients. 
So, you know, and I also get, you, you know, people call because they say, oh, well, we, you know, so-and-so told us to, you know, that you've worked with them and, and it was, you know, worked out. So, mm -hmm. you know, we wanted to give it a try. Well, you know, you were talking a few minutes ago about the business um, trials of coffee shop. The government trials of counseling, there must be a lot of uh, reporting and paperwork and accountability there. Is, is that a burden um, in what you do? That, you know what, that Regulations is, and so forth. Well, yeah, I, you know, the work that I do with DHR does require a lot of documentation because oftentimes I'll be um, called into court, which that has been really interesting um, and a dimension of counseling that I never... Uh, considered or thought I would be involved with going but into court yeah but that that's very interesting when you go into court because you you know the opposing uh, counsel their job is to knock you off balance and to discredit you so if you don't go into court knowing firmly what you know um, then you're gonna get ripped to shreds <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? so so I do you know and I realized that you know growing up in a family being um, one of five children is you know I can take it <laughs> you know you can challenge me it doesn't bother me yeah. um, because I do know what I know yeah you're confident absolutely absolutely especially when it comes to working with children um, because I've seen um, you know, I've seen children be um, hurt by choices that that adults make, and I will always, um, I will always do what's best for the child. Well, I'm so glad that I got a chance to meet you and talk with you. This well, is a real you. delight for me. Thank you. And uh, what you're doing, I'm jealous. Wow, it just sounds like such a You know great... what? And listen, I encourage you to, to hang up a shingle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I love it. And I find, you know, there's, there's so much that I have yet to learn. And I spend a lot of time researching. And, you know, when things come up, I want to make sure that I'm providing, you know, the best therapy or the best therapeutic options. And, and that is challenging as well. You know, so. Well, you know, I, I think there's probably a little bit of in all of us that we want to reach out and help other people. Oh, yeah. And it's a real life challenge to figure out how to, to best do that. Sometimes we, we do it the wrong way and we're not helping or something, you know, maybe we don't really have the aptitude. Well, uh, I, I, had think... a, I had a friend tell me one time I, uh, that, I, that I was going back to school, I was going to get this degree in psychology. And this lady said, you can't do that. You have no empathy for others. <laughs> well, that's true. Well, you know, that is kind of true, but yeah. uh, you have to work at it, I guess. But, well, I, I think, too, that we can all help each other, you know, and especially during this time when everybody's struggling so much with coronavirus and, right. you know, um, so much is going on that uh, we can help each other by just kind of a check-in, you know. Are you okay? Are you doing okay? Um and letting somebody know that, you know, look, if, if you need to talk, I'm here, um, but I just want to make sure you're okay. You know, and that's a big thing, too, with, like, suicide prevention is just checking in with people. Are you okay? You know, I love you. I'm glad you're here. Can I help you? And no whack. And no whack. Annie, <laughs> it's been a delight having you here on Lloyd & Friends. And uh, for those of you who are tuned in, don't forget to uh, tell your friends that, uh, uh, the show airs every Saturday at 10. I don't know who's on it from Saturday to Saturday. <laughs> but the shows are also archived on my YouTube channel. You can go to uh, YouTube and Lloyd and Friends and find Annie's interview and uh, listen to it. And I hope you will do that so that everybody will be uh, have the opportunity to listen to her. Thank you, Lloyd. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Lloyd and Friends Show with Lloyd Overton. 